Uh, okay, so let's start. Uh, I'm here to present our work as an alternative to nested uh, visualization. Uh, the name of the presentation is No More Turtle Turtles. It's a uh, referral to the original article of nested visualization, the turtle project. So uh, what's the problem here? Uh, the problem is that uh, we have customers, cloud customers, that want to spawn VMs. Uh, for example, on KubeVirt, you have uh, VM-based uh, workload. Uh, workers are VM, or in Kata containers, for example, you want to increase boundaries using uh, virtual machines. And right now, you only have uh, two options. You can either use uh, uh, virtual machines on bare metal systems, and those are quite expensive to, to rent a uh, bare metal system, and they don't really, you don't really have much options of uh, customization of the, of the system itself. I mean, you cannot choose, can't really choose to have a small bare metal system. You either get tons of core and tons of RAM, or you just don't get it. Or you can use uh, nested virtualization. So you just rent a standard uh, uh, virtual machines, and you use that to uh, spawn nested uh, virtual machines. But that has some other issues. Uh, you do miss some features in the nested uh, virtualization. So for example, a confidentiality, uh, you cannot use hardware uh, encryption. So Intel TDX or AMD SEV or IBM PVM. You also have some problem in terms of uh, security because the, the code base to enable nesting is uh, quite large. And larger code base means higher chance of uh, bugs and you still uh, and you do miss uh, a bit of uh, performance with nested compared to the standard vm and for these reasons the cloud providers most uh, cloud providers they don't allow it so if you actually uh, want to do it you can't because it's not uh, available to you so uh, what we thought of was to flatten the hierarchy so uh, basically we create a uh, a special VM, we call it a primary VM, that is able to uh, talk to the, to the host and ask to, for uh, some things. So uh, the, the VM is given uh, some resources that it's booted with, so a number of CPU, some storage, the, some memory, and so on. And it can uh, ask the, the host to just take some of these resources away from itself and use them to spawn uh, secondary a virtual machine, and then it's, be, it, it's able to control them, uh, access, uh, delete it, uh, pause them, modify them, and, uh, and so on. Uh, KVM already does some kind of a hierarchy flattening, so it has a VM control structure for nesting and uh, a shadow page table that actually accelerates the sum operation, and that kind of solves uh, some problems of performance, but not all of them. Uh, most, uh, most of all, like uh, I.O. is not really as good, uh, latency is not really as good, and you're still missing some features like uh, hardware encryption. So yeah, this is uh, what we're at with nesting. We have the host with a virtualization software that spawns a standard virtual machine with, with its own version of the virtualization software that's used to spawn a nested VM. And we want to go to a situation like this, where the, the virtualization software spawns both the, the primary VM and the secondary VM. And the primary VM just has access and some basic control over it. <coughs> What are the challenges of, uh, of this? Well, uh, first of all, uh, on, uh, in terms of security, you need to uh, make sure that the system, the rest of the system is unaffected by it. So uh, exactly like nested VMs, it doesn't matter how many you spawn. For the, for the host, it's like they have a single uh, virtual machine. And like this, it doesn't matter how many secondary VMs you spawn for the host, it should be exactly the same. And uh, so that's why the, the primary VM only has access some, to some pre predefined action. It doesn't have uh, access to the whole control plane. And another issue is the other way around. Not only you need to protect the, the host from the, 
primary and secondary VMs, you also need to uh, protect the primary VM from the rest of the system. So if you have other VMs, you need to be sure that they don't have access to the channel of communication, for example, between the host uh, primary and secondary VMs. And also the secondary VMs should act like nested VMs, so other VMs should not be able to see them. <coughs> so this is where we start. We have on the left the level zero, the host, with its version of the virtualization software, and on the right we have the primary VM spawn. Uh, to allow communication, we need to add a component which we called the secondary VM daemon. Uh, actually, we have one for each primary VM to uh, avoid interference and potential uh, voluntary or involuntary uh, DO uh, DOS attacks. Uh, then we have a template that the, the host can use to spawn uh, every secondary VM it's asked to. And now we have uh, one final problem, which is uh, how do we get the image from the primary VM to the host to boot? And uh, we cannot just copy it because uh, that way the, any primary VM could just keep sending data to the host and fill up the host uh, space. So that's why we add a secondary disk, secondary drive, a virtual drive, where the primary VM can put the image of the, of the secondary VMs. And finally, we encapsulate everything in a pool of resources, and those are the ones that they are allowed to use. Uh, the, the daemon is also part of the, these resources. So <coughs> now a primary VM that wants to spawn a secondary VM asks, uh, send the request to, to the daemon. The daemon uh, unplugs the, the storage, it gets the image, it will shrink the, the secondary drive to the new size, which is the old size minus the size of the secondary VM image, and it will plug it back. And now it has every information it needs. So it has the request, it has the template, it has the image, and it will just start the secondary VM and connect them to the primary VM. Uh, this is a table of uh, comparison between the current solution, so standard plus tested and bare metal plus standard. And this is a comparison. So it's uh, as cheap, it should be as cheap as uh, standard because for a cloud provider it doesn't really change much to, to, spawn, to spawn one or the other. It has some kind of uh, flexibility issue. So you do have your uh, storage divided into, you have the secondary drive and your primary drive. Also, you do have some problem with memory, but it's still much, you have much more choice than the bare metal system. And you have the full hardware feature available to you for the secondary VM. So you have encryption, you have uh, through device pass through, you do have some virtual IOMU for the for nested, but you have uh, you take uh, quite a big hit in performance there, and that's the whole point of pass through anyway. And you are uh, secondary VMs are as fast as standard VM because they are standard VMs. So uh, now let's go through all the components of uh, of this. Uh, the most important one is the daemon. The daemon is the one that uh, talks to the primary VM. Uh, with the channel we use is VSOC. Uh, VSOC was an easy choice because it's only visible in virtualized environments, so there's less chance for other software to, to interfere with it. And we can use the ID of the device of the, of the primary VM as, uh, to discern traffic between all the primary VMs. And actually, this, the, that also gives us uh, a way to demote a primary VM to a standard VM. You just remove the VSOC device, you remove the secondary drive, and you just have a standard VM. And that, uh, the, the daemon is the, the main component that does all the stuff uh, on the behalf of the primary VM. Another important stuff is the uh, resource pool. And, uh, the main component of the resource uh, pool enforcement is C group. So we have a uh, CPU set to ensure that the number of cores stays the same and uh, high memory, uh, max memory for memory to ensure that the memory is, uh, you don't go over the, the memory you started with. Uh, 
right now those are the two that we implemented but we will add some other things to make sure that other uh, <coughs> other stuff needs uh, to be proportional so uh, for example block block uh, scheduling uh, weights to be sure that all groups have the same bandwidth allowed uh, no matter how many no matter how many secondary vm you spawn uh, one problem that the C group uh, doesn't solve is the storage, like we talked about. So that's where we just do the unplug, uh, shrink, and replug uh, thing. And finally, network. Every time you spawn a primary VM, you create a virtual network, and you connect everything to it. So it's easy to, for them to talk and the rest of the system to not know. Uh, so. Uh, and up to this point, I just talked about concept and not really about a specific uh, a software layer. And that's because this is supposed to be a general solution. It doesn't matter which uh, visualization st stack you use. Uh, you can implement your own version of the daemon and your own version of the, the client and it should be good to go. But we did have a proof of concept in Libvirt. Uh, because, well, it's open source, it supports already multiple hypervisors, so not only KVM, you can use uh, many more of them. It already has a systemd integration, and uh, with systemd we have access to C groups, so it was quite easy for us to just add our limits to it. And it's easy to have devices uh, uh, attached and detached at uh, runtime, for example, network and storage and now let me show you a demo so on the left you we have the host which has a, a single primary vm running and on the right you have three instances of the same uh, primary vm the primary vm is encrypted with uh, amd scv and you can see that we have the vdb the secondary disk which is 50 gigabytes and inside that disk, we already have the, the images of the secondary VM we want to spawn. And now from the second instance, we uh, send a message to the host. We want a uh, secondary VM with two CPUs, four gigabytes of RAM, that image. Uh, the, the image is raw. We want it encrypted and so create it. And uh, as you can see, the Right now, it's a simple plain text string to be parsed by the host. This will change in the future, but for a proof of concept, it's fine. And as you can see on the host side, we have spawned the secondary VM. We have a sense of hierarchy. So this is the secondary of one. You can see on the screen, the, but on the left, you have the IDs of the VMs. And now we are spawning, spawning another one. Uh, which is not encrypted. Again, uh, sending it uh, plain text on the host. It's done. You can see it. Again, it's a secondary one, the primary VMS ID one. And you can see that the disk is now 28 gigabytes. That means the, the secondary VM in total were 22 gigabytes. And now we can access them using the, the network. And uh, <coughs> and uh, you can see that it's in fact encrypted uh, like we asked. So we can use encryption both in primary and secondary VM at the same time. And last one, we can access it, but this one is not going to be encrypted because we didn't ask to, to be encrypted. And uh, finally, make sure that this is not encrypted. Finally, the, the last, another thing that we want to show is the resource usage. So in the host, we're going to have a resource monitor and we are going to have a few stressors in the primary VM, uh, CPU and memory stressor on the primary VM and on the secondary VMs. And as you can see, only uh, four CPUs are being uh, utilized. And that's because that's the resources the, the primary VM has been 
given. So it doesn't matter how many stressors on how many virtual machines you, you launch, that's what the hosts see. And uh, one final thing is that uh, the hierarchy is a strong hierarchy, so you cannot have orphaned secondary VMs. So let's log out. And so if you kill the primary VM, then that means all the other secondary VM gets destroyed uh, automatically. Yeah, no more. OK, so this is where we are at right now. We are going to do some other stuff in the future. The, the most important one is going to have uh, a uh, more defined way to talk between the primary VM and the host. We, we settled on the VSOC for the reason uh, that I talked before, but we need to decide on the format, probably a form of XML or JSON, and uh, encryption. I mean, the, the channel is invisible from the outside, but if you add encryption, it's better. Then we will clean up our code in an early state and try to upstream it so that this is going to be a baked in feature to divert. It's going to have, you can add a simple primary tag in your XML file and that will just do everything for you. We'll boot a VM that's going to be a primary VM that uh, can talk to the host using whatever clients it has. And uh, Another thing, we want to improve the C group stuff like I talked about. We want to add some other limits like uh, block limits and uh, so on. Uh, another thing is going to be to uh, uh, improve the isolation for, of the primary VM in the host. Uh, <coughs> the, the most important one is uh, we found that the CPU set of C group doesn't really work as well as the boot parameters uh, ISOL CPU, which was what we were using in the beginning. So we will try to have uh, uh, to improve that and make it act more like ISOL CPUs. And another thing is we want to investigate over the, the storage solution, so the, how to get the secondary VM images. We tried a few stuff and then we settled on the plug and plug. So we tried like NFS, having an NFS server in the primary VM so that the host can just access the data and spawn it, but that's quite slow in terms of uh, IO performance in the secondary VMs. We also tried to hack the QCOW layer and the QCOW file system and have the secondary VM be an overlay of the primary VM. So for the host, the, the secondary VM is a snapshot of the primary VM and you can boot it, but that still increases the size inside the host and that's not allowed. And uh, the final thing that we tried to do was uh, for the primary VM to tell the host which were the physical blocks where the image was located. And then in the host, you create a fake disk with a, a file system which mirrors the file system in the primary VM. So you can create an inode that points to the correct blocks and you access the file directly. But then you need the kernel to synchronize. And I don't think that's ever going to be accepted in the, for, from the kernel community. And yeah, that was it. If you have questions yeah, yeah. Uh, so the question is can you boot more of this uh, secondary or primaries yeah. well you can boot, secondary VM to boot VM. Uh, we we thought about it so we do have a vision of a hierarchy in the host so it's possible we didn't implement it yet but yeah in theory you, I don't see any problem they are all at the same level uh, from a virtualization perspective. But uh, on the host, you can see which one belongs to which. Uh, first on the, yeah.
well, uh, the uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes are the most, uh, uh, like the, the one that comes to mind. So they, uh, they usually have worker nodes uh, inside VMs. And since they, the, the user is given a VM to begin with, they don't have the access to spawning nested VM in cloud. And so they need to do, do it somewhere. And this might be one way to do it. Uh, yeah? So actually, my question is a follow up question. Uh, have you considered the QGIS uh, in the integrating this solution into QGIS? And what would be That's probably the, maybe not the next step, but trying to have a daemon version of, uh, of this inside Kubevert. It's something that we wrote somewhere and that we will investigate. Yeah. Yeah. Is the daemon a user space or you also have parts in KVM? Uh, no, it's uh, all user space. Got it. What's the reason for like a secondary VM versus just a pool of VMs talking to each other over, the, over networking? Uh, uh, like, OK. So if you have one, like if you spawn multiple VMs on a host, you pay for each one of them. And uh, that might be something that you don't want to do. So you just get one VM and you just use the, the same resources over and over again. Okay. Any, yeah? Uh, the problem with the QCOW, so okay, this uh, was for, the, for the, the thing that we tried to get the image from the primary VM. We tried to get the QCOW and have it as an overlay of the primary VM QCOW file. So you have the primary VM QCOW, which has a snapshot, which is not really a snapshot, is a secondary VM, and you just boot that. But a snapshot is a diff between those files, so it was still quite huge, and that's, you know, that's not something that we can allow because you fill up the whole space the more secondary VMs you boot, and uh, yeah. Yeah. The, this is something that we will have to talk to the cloud providers. Probably there is going to be a limit uh, of how, how many encrypted VMs you are allowed to, to boot. Not unencrypted, as many as you want. Encrypted, you're going to have a limit. I have a yeah. question from uh, the chat. Can okay. you hear me OK? You can hear me. OK, it says, um, so the secondary VM does not consume any memory of the primary. How do you shrink the memory size of the primary VM when a secondary VM starts? Yes, you can cap the total sum via a host C group, but the primary VM will happily use the memory until C group will kill one of the processes. So the question is more C group capping OOM killer versus using the existing shrinkers might have different end results. One is a fatal kill, maybe the primary ouch versus not being able to start the secondary nested VM. Uh, yeah, so when the, the secondary VM is not encrypted, we didn't find any problem. When it's encrypted, the memory is pinned and we do uh, remove the memory. We use a similar mechanism to the disk. So we have some uh, slots of memory. You remove those uh, virtual slots and you assign them to the to the secondary VM. So the primary VM actually does see, uh, uh, contrary to the CPUs, so primary VM always has a vision of the same number of CPUs. Memory, when you spawn a secondary VM, you see that your memory is shrinking. Great, thank you. And another question here. Resources from the primary VM, unless you have Kubernetes node running there, how do you let the schedule know that it actually has less resources to schedule for its bugs? Yeah, yeah, that was uh, an issue that uh, really came, and 
so on the CPU side, you really don't have a problem because the CPUs are virtual CPUs. You can just have as many. And uh, on the memory side, yeah, that's the that's an issue, and you're going to need to to change a bit the the worker nodes so that he knows that his memory are diminishing. Any more questions? No? Well, thank you. If you have some other question, you can find our email and write to any of the team. Which, yeah. Thank you.